Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Utval Gadaraji, and good day to those of you who are in different time zones. I'm a computer scientist by training. I work within the AI innovation team at Toloka, and I engage with the research and data teams as a developer advocate. Toloka, for those of you who are uninitiated, offers high quality data solutions for each and every stage of the AI development lifecycle. Another hat that I wear is that of an assistant professor at TU Delft in the Netherlands, where I co-lead a research line on human-centered AI and crowd computing. I also have the privilege of uh, co-directing an AI lab at Delft University that's called Design at Scale. But enough about me. I'd like to learn what you think about this particular image that you see on your screens. Feel free to use the chat to chime in. And Carolina here has kindly offered to help me out with processing the chat as we move along through the course of this webinar. Surely some of you have seen this before. If you haven't, make your best guess of what this potentially could be. Is it something you'd stomach? Is that something you can't even imagine? Certainly for some people from around the world, this would be a site you never caught before. For some others, you've probably eaten something like this in your bowl. So we have many croissants in milk, croissants in milk, croissant cereal, croissants. Excellent. Yeah. And as you can imagine, we've all probably understood this notion or concept of a croissant. Perhaps not all of us have been lucky enough to try mini croissants in a cereal bowl. How about this next one, though? Does this image, in your opinion, represent a typical croissant? And I'm speaking about the one on the top. So of course, we've probably seen and consumed the croissant that is presented at the bottom left-hand side of your screen, but the one on top is one intriguing sight. To what extent do you think this one represents a typical croissant? And we'll just give you a few seconds to get nice and warmed up as we dive into the deeper end of this discourse on mitigating biases today. Well, clearly a lot of you think it's not a typical croissant and some of you think it is a typical croissant, right? So it's interesting to see that there's some amount of spread around this notion of whether or not this croissant that you see on the top left-hand side, it's possibly filled with pistachio and not avocado, if uh, some of you thought that's what it was. How about this image over here? So both of these uh, images on the top and bottom represent toggle buttons. And there are all kinds of interesting applications in this uh, age of AI where metaverse and augmented reality applications are also taking center stage to help perhaps uh, specially abled individuals right inside households in case they require aids with respect to vision. To what extent do these images represent what's typically associated to be a toggle button? Clearly these are present on different kinds of applications. So if you have some AI that's processing this at an image level, again, we observe that there's a fair bit of split between those who conceive this as being a fair representation of a toggle button, but there are also others who think this is not a typical toggle button, right? And I can come up with a plethora of examples where we probably observe a certain amount of spread across the notions of whether or not this is a typical muffin or is this really a typical chihuahua, right? And why I'm speaking about all of this is because the notions of typicality and equally atypicality are distinguishable by the strength of association that we can make between the observable properties and the concepts themselves. Uh, this is an interesting uh, idea to hold in mind, not least because of the world that we're living in right now. Despite the massive success of AI-based systems that we've continue to witness in recent times, existing models also suffer from a severe reliability issue. We only need to open the closest newspaper to come across yet another story that showcases how AI has gone wrong. And this highlights the importance of identifying and characterizing errors so that these can be systematically addressed, if not fully fixed, right? Take this example uh, that's being broadcast on your screens right now. There is a billboard at the back of a truck Right, And imagine you have a perception model that's used in a self-driving car, and it identifies the content of the ads in the image on the backside of the truck as being a composition of buildings and electric poles. Now, that can be all kinds of problematic, and I don't need to spell that out. One of the reasons why many of these 
errors happen and transpire is because of this dissonance between human and machine understanding and the kind of human understanding that we have been striving to imbibe with machines. Now, images are more than a simple collection of objects or attributes, right? They represent a web of relationships among interconnected objects. Now, on the right-hand sides of your screen, you see a series of images, four of them precisely, of uh, scenes that are from the class of either living rooms or outdoor scenes. And the one at the bottom right-hand side is actually one of an airport, right? Imagine you train a model that is to recognize scenes accurately. We can observe a lot of interesting artifacts of such models when they're deployed in the real world. Now, compared to computer models, it's easy for humans to recognize even complex images. One of the reasons why that's the case is because the human mind perceives the world in a more discrete fashion. But computer models, on the other hand, see the world in a continuous form. One of the other aspects, of course, is that the human mental model of the world around us makes prediction more semantic by considering the context that's relevant. But computer models, on the other hand, predict purely using statistical reasoning and often ignore contextual cues if they're not particularly uh, catered to. So that's exactly the example that is being uh, highlighted here on your screen. So if you can look at the top right-hand side, you see that an actual living room is successfully predicted as a living room. But on the other hand, because of the objects that co-occur in these scenes, just because of the fact that there were a few sofas or couches placed on a street, this particular model incorrectly predicted that scene as being that of a living room. And on the right-hand side, on the bottom, once again, you notice that because of those chairs that are present in what appears to be an airport hangar, the model, once again, incorrectly uh, predicts this to be the, a living room. Now, we have two types of errors in almost all the AI-based models that are created and deployed in the real world these days. The first error type is what's commonly called the family of known unknowns, where you know that the model makes predictions with low confidence and you're aware of the model's weaknesses in that case, right? But the second type of error, the so-called family of unknown unknowns is more problematic and can lead to very uh, serious consequences because of the fact that the model makes seriously wrong predictions but with high confidence. Now that's quite difficult to explore and capture. And this is essentially what contributes to model blind spots. Unknown unknowns are often caused by systematic biases in the training data. And as shown in this example, and perhaps one of the most commonly used examples in this discourse is the classic cat versus dog uh, classifier, right? And because of the fact that perhaps a model has only been trained and only saw black dogs during the training phase, it has no clue that dogs can also be white, right? So it incorrectly predicts uh, and classifies a black dog as being white. Now, recent works have also shown that unknown unknowns reside in certain partitions of the feature space rather than being distributed evenly across the entire feature space, right? These partitions are called blind spots, as I was trying to highlight. And these are blind spots where data points are highly correlated and often have the same feature deficiency. So if you can identify and discover that there's a certain blind spot, it's highly likely that you'll discover other blind spots that are related to exactly that same feature space, right? But as it's easier said than done, in reality and in a lot of practical purposes, this is extremely hard to do. It's hard to discover blind spots that exist in um, models that are deployed and trained and built. But let's break this down a little bit further, right? What is all of this magic around known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Well, if you break this into a quadrant of knowledge, you can think about these as four different quadrants. The first one being known knowns, where you're actually aware and you understand the things that are known. If you think about the known unknowns, these are the quantum of things that we are aware of, but do not understand, right? And we, we know that these are specific aspects that we lack an understanding around. Unknown knowns are things we understand, but are not aware of. And finally, this interesting and quite challenging quadrant of knowledge, especially when you think about machine learning models that are being deployed in the real world, are the unknown unknowns. These are the things that we neither understand nor that we're aware of.
And it's important to contextualize this in the day and age of LLMs, right? Large language models are very much the elephant in every room where conversations are being had about technology these days. Do large language models really know what they know? And more importantly, are they aware of what they do not know? Now, these are complex questions that researchers and practitioners across the world, across different research communities are trying to battle with and boil uh, down to the bottom of those intriguing questions. And there's an important question to also try and understand the certainty of the statements that are being generated so that you can prevent language models from making up facts, right? We've uh, also observed many an anecdote about models hallucinating when deployed in interesting and varied, but very real context. Now, one of the things that has transpired as a common understanding and consensus at this point in the community and across different communities is that human input is essential in a understanding how large language models generate content and how they can be curated, but also in how they can be evaluated in terms of the known unknowns, but more importantly, in discovering the unknown unknowns, which is where all the problems or big problems appear. Now, building from that, we can reiterate that the need of the hour is to proactively discover and characterize unknown unknowns, especially if you think, um, and if you want to ground this in the context of reliable image recognition systems. That very first example that I was uh, providing sort of paints this picture within the scope of image recognition systems. And I'll use that as a running example for the rest of this talk. But do note that this uh, is very applicable to contexts that also diverge from image recognition systems. And I'll lean heavily on some of our recent work that was published at one of the premier intelligent user interface uh, venues called IUI. Um, and this introduces a tool and workflow called Perspective, where we want to leverage human understanding for identifying and characterizing image atypicality. Let me ask you a question. Here's an image on your screen once again. We see a saliency map, right? These maps are increasingly relevant in the explainable AI space where we're trying to communicate to end users and all kinds of stakeholders a little bit about what the models have learned and what the rationale behind decision-making is. Now imagine there's a scene again to continue with that running example. And the purpose of the model is to try and recognize the scene that is being displayed. And uh, the model, well, I'd like to hear from you first up about what scene you all think this is. Feel free to get going on your keyboards and I'd love to see some chatter here. Which scene do you think is being depicted here? And what is the scene that the model is trying to figure out? I see some answers trickling in. Carolina, can you do me a... Yeah, so we have kitchen, um, kitchen counter, counter, kitchen. So Right. Excellent. Thank you. Indeed. Kitchen with chairs for the exterior. Right. Yeah. So indeed, right? It's quite obvious for us as humans that the scene that's being represented over here is a, ki is a kitchen. But what you'll notice if you observe closely and I've you know done uh, due diligence to highlight what objects the model's basing its rationale on and you identify that it's the ceiling and a chair that the model has used in order to deduce the fact that this is a kitchen and this was an accurate classification right it's a real world example that I've picked up and I'm presenting over here but what we can also immediately recognize is the fact that these are not necessarily the objects that you would immediately associate with a kitchen right let me ask you another question. Which objects would you rather that uh, this model picked up to ground its rationale of identifying this as a kitchen? Because I could argue that you could potentially find a ceiling in any living space that is inside a building. And you can find chairs in all kinds of different contexts, right? I can find chairs in stadiums. I can find chairs in all kinds of rooms and studies and whatever else. But what, in your opinion, is you know the model better off recognizing and grounding its rationale on if you were thinking about this particular image itself. We have oven, coffee, coffee machine, the oven seems like another one, appliances. Excellent. Again, I'm in agreement. And that's the human rationale that we're trying to bring to the fore. If you just look at that image, there are 
objects like the countertop, the sink, the microwave, and the oven, which are all much stronger and better grounds for recognizing this as a kitchen. And we as humans have that intricate understanding of the context and the environment that we subliminally and subconsciously use to make our uh, decision-making processes well-informed. Models, on the other hand, need to be empowered with this sort of uh, external knowledge. So what we're trying to do is uh, absorbing that information from humans because human input and human knowledge is essential in sharing this and imparting that into the models to try and identify the unknown unknowns and the blind spots within models that are trained and deployed. How do we go about doing this? Well, first up, we created a workflow that orchestrates this process that allows us to tap into common sense knowledge from humans. And notice that in a lot of tasks, like this, you don't necessarily require expert knowledge. Sure, granted there are tasks if you're thinking about applications in a very well-defined niche domain, think recognizing surgical instruments or trying to recognize uh, various strains of cancers and so on and so forth, radiology applications, right? Those applications might require a fair bit of expertise, but there's a large family of uh, applications where you don't require a lot of expertise and you really require human common sense knowledge being uh, delivered and elicited. And if you can come up with workflows like this that allow users to indulge in an annotation mechanism that brings to fore human input that can then be boiled down and fed back into models to identify, explore potential blind spots or biases in them, that's something that is very timely and important at this point in time. So the annotation workflow that we created was first trying to ask humans to identify uh, the objects that were presented within a specific class that they believe should be valid grounds for the model to pick up and learn um, in order to determine the class labels, right? Imagine I presented that previous image. I'd love for the model to identify this as a kitchen, but for the right reasons. So we can um, quite easily orchestrate this in a human annotation workflow where we can ask people to draw bounding boxes, identify the objects and the attributes that are present in the given image, but also define relationships between the objects that are present. Right? And once you uh, can go about ranking the importance of the objects and the saliency of their presence in determining the scene, you can understand how it's possible to obtain a very fine grained and granular understanding of context itself. Now, what we did with Perspective was we also empowered uh, users to improve the entire annotation process. How does that work? I'll break it down uh, for you by highlighting a couple of key problems, right? Quite often, um, and I think this we're, we're all probably in agreement with the importance of clean data sets. Human input and data, especially in a lot of data-driven applications, are pivotal, and this is a message that's now relatively well understood. Even in the age of AI and even in the age of LLMs uh, and generative AI and larger applications, the value of clean human data is, uh, you know, is gold dust. It's pretty uh, important and uh, to stress this very point because of the fact that a lot of biases that seep into models are a result of skewed data sets or a result of um, incorrectly identified and elicited knowledge. Case in point, um, imagine you have a data set that you're trying to gather annotations from humans on, and for the sake of the running example, let's consider living rooms once again. Now, imagine that I produce a series of images uh, of living rooms to individuals and ask them to rate these on a scale of relevancy. So to what extent is this image relevant to the concept or notion or class of living room versus uh, on a given scale, right? Versus another image. And imagine that this annotation process as any annotation process occurs in a sequential order, right? Now there are lots of issues with uh, why uh, biases seep into collections of uh, annotations in that fashion. A, because I might have received an image that I thought was relevant on a scale of, well, one to five, but let's say I thought that was a four. And then I saw another image, which I think, well, it's more relevant than previous ones. So let me give that a five, right? And all of a sudden, I somewhere down the line, I come up with a few other images, which I think are the perfect representation of uh, what a living room should be. But I've already extinguished the bandwidth in my scale to show you what the most relevant image is. Then, well, I'm going to have to settle 
with a five for a series of other perhaps even more relevant images to that particular class. And that's one way in which noise creeps into these data sets and um, also shapes certain systematic biases. The other view, of course, is that people uh, and annotation workflows don't often provide annotators an overview of what the data set contains. Now, let me walk you down through uh, perspective and what perspective does to tackle that very challenge. On the left-hand sides of your screen, you see this large image of a class that has been classified as a croissant. And if I can direct your attention to the left bottom of that very image, you can notice that there are a couple of croissants underneath this little uh, glass lid, right? And it's fair to say that this uh, image can be represented or classified as one that is demonstrating croissants, right? But if you have a data set that also has images of croissants as the pure subject of the image, now it's easy to see why models can learn certain patterns that are perhaps statistically guided, but conceptually misguided, right? And to overcome that problem, and it's clearly a problem that resides in the notion of typicality, one of the aspects that we began this conversation with, right? So to what extent is this image typical of croissants? Now that notion of typicality can be grounded either in the real world. You can think about, hey, is this how all the croissants in the world look? So based on my human knowledge and understanding, is this what typical croissants look like? Do croissants typically have this filling with pistachio in them, right? Or is this a typical croissant, but with respect to this data set alone, right? Imagine you have data sets with uh, croissants as the subject matter of images, in which case you would argue that the image on the left-hand side is atypical of croissants within this particular data set. And if you can ground this understanding and these annotations that people are providing within the context of that annotation process, a, within the scope of the data set, but also presenting a representative sample of croissants that are present in the entire data set, you empower the user with this ability to provide more nuance to their uh, data annotation itself, right? And that's essentially what we attempt to do by providing three different views during this annotation process. So in the first part, we present visually similar um, annotations or vis sorry, visually similar images that can allow people to ground their understanding of what are the other images that look like this, but are probably of different classes, right? You could also argue that this image on the left-hand side could be um, within the class of barista or within the class of a buffet, right? So what are those classes that are potentially conflicting that might add noise to the classes that the model is learning? Very important uh, thing to consider during the annotation process itself. Because once you've annotated it, you've created the data set, any biases that are present in the data will be propagated to the models that are learned on top of them, right? It's a well understood lesson. So let's fix the problem. Let's nip it in the bud. I think it's clear and evident that we need human input, but how can we acquire human input uh, in a bias aware fashion is that million dollar question, which we uh, are proposing can be tackled by providing annotators with this overview of visually similar images, but also a sample of all the other uh, potentially diverse images in the data set, but also present them a representative sample so that they understand what the distribution across these potentially diverse images of croissant in this example is like with that data set. Now going back, what we do is we provide these auxiliary images and then ask questions to uh, crowd workers who you can consider as non-expert humans who are brought into these tasks and asking them questions along the order of, well, is this image about a particular class? And you're in this case, it was the class of birds. Um, people can answer that with a yes, no, or maybe because of the fact that there could be subjectivity in interpretations. We then ask them to talk about whether or the extent to which this is a typical uh, bird or is this unusual? So they express that. And then we also acquire and elicit more details about the code that they would uh, assign with respect to that categorization. Right, so that's essentially the crux of the uh, matter over here. Can we present an overview to the annotators and empower them to produce higher quality annotations, right? And that's that's the problem that we can tackle. Uh, there's plenty more I can say on that subject, but I just wanted to share a few interesting insights. So we uh, tried to apply existing 
uh, state-of-the-art models that are present. Take, for example, the Google Vision API or the Amazon Recognition API, Microsoft Azure Vision API. And we wanted to see the extent to which on uh, well-defined data sets that these Vision APIs are capable of classifying uh, typical images accurately, but more importantly, atypical images accurately. And what you can clearly see in this particular depiction, and we did this through a series of guesses, right? So we allowed the models to uh, take multiple guesses each time they were getting it wrong. And on the x-axis, you see the number of guesses that these models made before they could accurately guess something. And on the y-axis, you see the uh, accuracy fraction, right, of their uh, performance on the classes of typical images as well as atypical images. So to what extent is a croissant that perhaps has a pistachio filling recognized as a croissant, right? Or to what extent is, I mean, I'm sure many of us have come across all kinds of graphic examples of things going wrong where there was a gentleman holding a hairdryer that was incorrectly classified as being a gun, right? It's important to think about these uh, notions of typicality and atypicality at the point of uh, annotation gathering, which is where all the you know, juice of the quality begins to flow in. And you can clearly see that uh, existing models fall below the threshold of what can be construed as being good performance, especially in the class of atypical images. Do check out this paper uh, for more interesting details and additional analysis. The key takeaway I'd like to share with you at this point is that annotations with this tool and a workflow called perspective in our analysis led to identification of the most atypical images and using human intelligence in that context um, allows us to expand labeling uh, workflows in a more meaningful fashion. Uh, response and data sampling biases also need to be addressed. Um, and one of the most important, important takeaways, I uh, beg your pardon, is that no, there's absolutely no place for mistakes in data annotation processes because of the fact that they can easily be propagated into patterns that the models end up learning, right? Remember, there's, these are quite simply statistical patterns that uh, models learn. It's not any knowledge that has greater grounds. At the end of the day, if you boil it down to the uh, most minute penny, the buck stops at the fact that there's a statistical reasoning uh, process and there's a pattern that the model has picked up, right? So especially if you're deploying such models in high stakes domains, uh, the importance of responsible and trustworthy notions in that context cannot be stressed further. That being said, allow me to transition into painting some of the uh, analogous challenges that uh, we are faced with now while we write this new wave of generative AI and in the context of large language models, right? I'm sure there's uh, no one here in this audience who's uh, unaware of the fact that uh, ChatGPT and GPT-4, you know, 3.5 and all kinds of large language models that are pre-trained uh, are capable of remarkable things. They can challenge humans and perform better than humans as well in certain tasks in a rather mind boggling fashion. And no sooner than GPT-4 was announced, uh, one of the co-founders immediately a few hours after that tweeted saying, oh, GPT-5, right? So that's the speed with which this uh, domain is moving. And I'm sure many of us here are also aware of the fact that ChatGPT can now see, hear and speak, right? So this speed with which this domain is progressing also stresses the caution with which we should pursue uh, development and design because of the fact that biases are just as prominent and relevant in this age of LLMs. So uh, recent work for uh, re from you know, all kinds of researchers and practitioners has focused on developing and understanding uh, potential applications of large language models across a variety of domains, and in equal parts, understanding the strengths and weaknesses of large language models as well, right? And what we've uh, understood and observed through uh, a body of work that has come out through the course of this year, ever since uh, the democratization of large language models, is the fact that bias uh, is absolutely prominent in a lot of different ways. Here's some work by Takur, who explored the fact that uh, gender biases uh, with respect to professions are things that uh, crop up quite easily when large language models are uh, developed and pre-trained on different data collections. In-context impersonation also revealed the fact that large language models have certain strengths, but also certain biases. 
There was other work from Motoki and colleagues who showed how uh, ChatGPT does encompass a lot of political bias. And there's also other work that has revealed demographic biases within the space of job recommendations when you try to use large language models uh, for interesting applications in that realm. I can go on and on, but let me leave you with one final example of uh, biases that have been studied and have been shown to be uh, prevalent in this context. Uh, and this is when it comes to the uh, identity stereotypes, right? Um, there's this very interesting work from Dingra et al. Uh, that came out of CMU earlier this year, where they uh, quite clearly highlighted how uh, sexual identity is a very strong uh, factor that large language models uh, build biases around. So what can we do about all of this, right? And one of the answers that has uh, come up through the community is instruction tuning can uh, you know, improve the nature of interactions between humans and large language models. And that has in fact been shown to be true in a lot of different domains, right? So instruction tuned large language models are quite effective in generating high quality natural language responses. But what's also uh, come out to be a you know, undesired side effect is the fact that inherent biases that are present in trained models are now also propagated into fine-tuned models. And if at all, they become even more consolidated. So if you consider training or, or fine-tuning a large language model based on a specific data set, so if you're thinking about an instruction tuning context, then imagine the instruction tuning data set that you're using is composed of a specific political bias. What you can expect, and this has been shown recently by this work by Istak and colleagues, is that the generated answers from such fine-tuned models will also share such biases, right? So what's clearly come out is the fact that the role of human input is one that's absolutely indispensable. But how exactly can we elicit human input, especially when you think about tacit knowledge, which isn't readily available in well-structured knowledge bases like your Wikipedias or your concept nets, where you're only scratching the surfaces of what's truly present in the common average human mind. Right? When I, if I was to keep pushing you towards telling me more and more about the common sense knowledge you have regarding any specific topic, we could spend all year long and not get to the last uh, tuple of knowledge that's there. So how can we come up with a scalable fashion that uh, can help elicit human input in a manner that can allow us to manage biases in large language models? If you think about the context of fine tuning and instruction tuning, and you know you you require data sets that are of high quality, you require humans to generate knowledge in a way that is not biased to specific perspectives. So how can we go about doing that? One of the ideas uh, we have been exploring in this space has to do with using games with purposes. So common sense knowledge, as I was trying to drive down, is almost fundamental in building your symbolic AI systems. And it's also quite useful in debugging, uh, deep, uh, deploying models. And uh, what's very well understood in this community is that existing knowledge acquisition methods are quite limited, right? You can't really extract broad and tacit negative knowledge so we said, why don't we use uh, a game with a purpose? And that's essentially what we did. We built this game called Find It Out. And for those of you who've played Guess Who, you'll see where the inspiration comes from. So to explain this, uh, and do feel free to try this out. It's a game that's live. It's a two-person game. And the whole purpose of this is to try and elicit uh, diverse knowledge in a very configurable fashion. Right? The game begins with two players being uh, presented a game board and the objective for each of the two players is to guess the other person's main card, right? So the main card in this case, if you can uh, look at the panel on the left-hand sides of your screen is the mink for this particular player. The other player is looking at the same composition of entities, but has another card, right? When the game begins, um, the asker is given the role of asking a question and the other player becomes a replier. And at the end of this turn, those roles are swapped and the game progresses. So in this example, the asker is asking the replier, is your card a carnivore, right? And based on the response, which the replier can present using the yes, no, or maybe in case they're not too sure, or also ask the asker to reformulate their question by using the unclear button, this can allow the uh, other player 
to rule out certain cards, right? The player can now say, well, based on your response, since this is not a carnivore, I can rule out certain cards. And these interactions allow us to gather knowledge that is generative. So an otter is a carnivore, is you know a positive generative piece of knowledge. But you can also understand that a hare is not a carnivore, right? In that same turn. Now, using the combination of these tuples of knowledge, you can also identify what's called discriminative knowledge. You know, in that same turn, you're able to identify that an otter is a hare, and it's different, uh, sorry, an otter is a carnivore, and it's different from a hare because a hare is not a carnivore, right? And these, uh, this ability to generate different types of knowledge, and especially knowledge that can be classified as being tacit, is uh, a powerful mechanism that can be used for uh, downstream AI tasks. Here's a simple example to paint that picture and make it a little clearer. The game board that you uh, that we deployed, we, we did this uh, across a series of experiments. And here's an example where one of the game boards contained the entities of floor, window, bathroom, walls, ceiling, chandelier, a mirror, and a bedroom. And a question that uh, came up was, can your car be used for decoration, right? And this is a tacit notion of uh, chandeliers and eventually it was asserted that a chandelier can be used for decoration. If you were talking about chandeliers, perhaps a lot of uh, things that would emanate immediately would be about perhaps their beauty or their sizes, their, the fact that you can hang them and uh, you know, perhaps the notion of it being a decorative item would you know, follow that. Right? So it's more tacit and harder to find in uh, readily available common sense knowledge bases. And the same can be said about the example below it, where uh, there was an assertion made that boots have uh, this property of being worn by cowboys. If I was to ask you about boots, perhaps the first bunch of things we'll talk about would be the make of them, the brands, the materials, is, are they leather boots, are they Chelsea boots, are they tall ones, are they heels on them, and all kinds of interesting things. And perhaps the assertion that these are typically also associated with cowboys is one that will follow much later. So some of the empirical results this end with an eye on the clock as well um, is uh, we, we ran a series of experiments where we had over 2,500 rounds, uh, 120 odd players played this, and this resulted in over 150,000 uh, knowledge tuples. And the efficiency of this game as we tested it was 10 times higher than a reference baseline. For those of you who've come across this game with a purpose called Burbosity, which came out in North America from university. I'm not quite sure, but if my memory serves me well, it was either the Stanford uh, design team or it was Berkeley, or it was a combination of uh, some of these big schools. And Burbosity uh, was uh, you know, paled in some of the comparisons. And uh, what we also found in our evaluation within downstream AI tasks, we considered these tasks of common sense question answering and the other task of identifying discriminative attributes. So for those of you who are uninitiated, uh, this task requires you to identify how two in entities can differ, right? So what makes a banana different from an apple? Is it the peel? Is it the texture? Is it the vitamins that are present? You can go on and on about it. And the capability to come up with as exhaustive a list of uh, properties that discriminate these attributes is a very valuable task to imbibe within a machine to try and understand uh, and engage in deep conversations. So what's also important to remember is uh, this is a game with a purpose. So you want to try and uh, gather all of this knowledge almost as a secondary reason that is absent from the player's game experience, right? So players who are engaging in this experience are truly just doing it because they're having fun. Well, behind the scenes, we're putting all of their uh, interactions to better use. So I think the analogous challenges that uh, I've been trying to portray and speak about over here when it comes to LLMs is how we can use tools like perspective to first identify and characterize biases in large language models, but also how we can generate and elicit diverse human input uh, by using games like Find It Out or other methodologies that tap into human knowledge and present them opportunities to uh, annotate data sets or create knowledge in an unadulterated clean environment so that we can mitigate and manage biases in fine-tuned large language models. Right? That's the key message that I want to share with you all today. And on a closing note, I'd like to communicate that human input and oversight are these essential and fundamentally important aspects uh, that we require if we want to overcome challenges in the space of 
creating, facilitating bias aware interactions with large language models. I hope uh, this was an inspiring uh, you know, collection of ideas and thoughts, and I can't wait to hear any questions that you may have for me right now. Okay, so someone asked, um, LLM can also be used for image having handwritten things. Right, so I'm, I'm gonna try and interpret that question a little bit. So I, I'm assuming the question is about whether a uh, textual large language model can be used to interpret images based on perhaps the image tags. I think that's certainly something that uh, people have been exploring. So for instance, uh, you can also think about uh, pipelines where you have uh, you know, text generated by language models, which are being used to then uh, generate images, right? So we've seen like the combination of your chat GPT with DALI, for instance, um, and certainly there's space over there to talk about biases, both with respect to the prompts that are uh, being given to the large language model and the text that's generated to describe an image and how that is in turn uh, used for a downstream application, perhaps to generate another image, right? So indeed, I think that's uh, more an observation than a question, or uh, if, I, if the question is around whether or not it's possible to do that, certainly is, right? I think you can use large language models to generate image descriptions by using um, prompt engineering, for example. But again, when, when we go about building such pipelines, uh, what's extremely valuable is to consider the notion of bias and how that can be propagated depending on the choices we make. Any other questions? Are you curious about the notions of typicality and atypicality? I hope that offered uh, a perspective on how annotation processes can be improved and the fundamental role that they can play in appropriately fine-tuning large language models. Excellent. If there are no further questions, I think this is a good note to end on. Thanks everyone for tuning in. It was a pleasure to speak to you all about some of these interesting ideas and how uh, important high quality data remains to be despite this age of uh, generative AI and the cat being thrown amongst the pigeons and lots of perspectives around whether or not this uh, spells an end for any human input whatsoever, but I think that's far from the reality. Uh, these are extreme narratives that are quite easy to propagate because uh, it's uh, easy to be afraid of the unknown, but uh, from a space where you know there's a fair amount of expertise and knowledge around how these technologies are actually being built and deployed, I think there is uh, an indispensable need for human input to understanding how exactly we can elicit accurate, high quality data from humans is still going to play a very important and fundamental role, not just in building large language models in a robust manner, robust to domains, robust to use cases where you apply and deploy them in the real world, but it's also going to play a very important role in our evaluation of existing large language models, how exactly can we use human input uh, Thanks to the diverse subjectivity that is uh, present across the diaspora when you think about the globe and the global population that might either be subject to large language models in one way, shape, or form, or might rely on large language models for certain decision making. So I hope this was engaging, and I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation in the future. Thank you, everyone.